Hello. Welcome to Books and Brews. The place where beer and literature meet. With your host, certified Cicerone, Michael Agnew. And Laura Mosica, author of The Blue Bells Chronicles. Each month we invite a guest author to read their words and talk about writing while sipping beers specially paired with their work. Today's guest is poet Ernie Brill. So sit back, pop a cold one, and dive into some books and brew. Long story. Okay. Are you ready then? We are ready. Let me. I think we are ready. How's your month been, Michael? Oh, it's been good. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, have you left the house? <laughs> <laughs> I have you... left the house. You had a trip um, to Utah, didn't you? Or am I like a month behind already on that? Uh, you're a month behind on that. That was a long time ago. Time flies. <laughs> you know, I was so embarrassed. Um, this this happened years ago, but one of my aunts had had um, surgery. And I thought it was like, you know, I don't know, a year or so ago, a few months. And I saw her at Christmas. Oh, how are you doing? Are you all better? All this? She's like, that was 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, time flies when that's you're a long, long that's a long <laughs> gap there Laura. Maybe it was only seven or eight maybe i can save the situation here <laughs> yeah yeah so where did you go this month uh so i i haven't really gone anywhere but i have two bits of exciting news does it involve uh, banjo uh the first one does involve banjo uh-huh. uh, and that is i have started taking lessons fantastic where Actually. Uh, from a guy who's a professional banjo player around town, um, Anthony Erick, who plays Uh in a couple of bands and does his own solo work and whatnot. Uh, so I've had two lessons so far. Very cool. Uh, That's a lot of fun. Turns out Uh my basic technique is not all that bad, so I haven't taught myself a whole lot of bad habits. That's good. Um, so that's the first bit of good, of exciting news. Uh, the second bit of exciting news is that, uh, Masako and I got engaged. Congratulations. Oh, congratulations. Fantastic. So did you have a really romantic moment? Uh, well, we had gone out for a, an anniversary dinner and uh-huh. had uh, several courses of really good Japanese food and a whole uh-huh. lot of sake. <laughs> All right. So, and then we came home and... Uh, I, I guess it wasn't terribly romantic because that's not really my style. <laughs> but I tried to make it as as romantic as I could, given who I am. The top uh, of your uh, romance level. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So next year. Congratulations! Do you have a date set already? Uh, June eighteenth. That's our anniversary. We Fantastic. Couldn't do it, uh, we couldn't squeeze it in before her semester started. We didn't want to do mm-hmm. it during the school year or during mm-hmm. the bleak cold of uh winter break so yeah. we figured if we have to wait until may we might as well wait until june <laughs> well that's fantastic congratulations yeah. Congrats, man. Uh, my month has been busy we took a trip down to tennessee and um had a good time down there and we we pulled out like i didn't want to bug people at the hotel but we always bring the guitar and flutes everywhere we go and so we went outside to play and all these people who were there like on a long-term work project for the government were sitting around and the guy pulled out his harmonica and this woman was just, she was having the greatest time listening. And so that was a lot of fun. Um, and then we've just, we've been taking a lot of scooter rides now that the weather's nice. So I put on my mm-hmm. helmet and we zoom down the highway, go find somewhere to have lakeside dining. So it's kind of oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. How about reading? Did you read some books this month? Uh, I have, again, I'm just reading for work. Uh, I am reading okay. the A to Z of gender and sexuality, which is a 300 page glossary of terms related to gender and sexuality. That just sounds um, like some fun light reading. Oh, it's great. Actually. I <laughs> learned so much. <laughs> Well, you know, I'm, I'm uh, reading like sort of two opposite things. I'm actually doing some heavy reading myself. I'm digging into Interior Castles by Teresa of Avila, St. Teresa of Avila. But then I'm also rereading the book that I helped co-write, 221 B.C., because um, I'm now working on 220 B.C., the sequel. 
And so I thought, you know, given that Kendall and I worked on this book, oh, I don't know, like five years ago, I should probably remember what happens in book one to know what happens in book two. (laughs) So. So awesome. Who's our guest today? Well, we are here. I believe we're on episode number 27. We have. It is episode number 27. And this is Ernie Brill, who is with us. Ernie Brill writes fiction and poetry. His breakthrough collection about black and white hospital workers was optioned and adapted by Ruby D and Aussie Davis for their PBS series with Ruby and Aussie. Miss D performed to critical acclaim. Mr. Brill obtained his BA and MA from San Francisco State University and was active in the 1968-69 historic strike that established the first school of ethnic studies in the world. He has published fiction and poetry widely, and his favorite writers include Virginia Woolf. I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this name correctly, Mahoud Darwish. Did I get that right? Mahmoud Darwish. Okay, I'm I'm up here, as as you can see in the background, we're up in the North Woods, and I didn't think to pack a printer, so I'm reading my own hand. I did all of my notes by hand this time, um, so I might be reading it wrong. Hyson Hi- Kim and Richard Wright. Yeah. Yeah, so welcome, Ernie. Welcome. And, yep. What is our first beer? Our first beer is a 2018 vintage of Liftbridge Commander. Liftbridge is a brewery in... Stillwater, Minnesota. Commander is their big English-style barrel-aged barley wine. Um, So you would love this one, Laura. It's uh, big (laughs) and rich and full-bodied and malty and bourbon-y. Oh, that sounds delicious. The reason I chose this one, uh, the the character, the, the person being talked about in this poem just struck me as, you know, this kind of dignified, gentle, older, not old, but older gentleman. Um, And so I wanted something that like matched that character. So an English style barley wine is very dignified and uh, kind of noble, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, they are great beers for aging. They can sit around in a cellar for quite a while. This vintage is only 2018, so it hasn't aged that long. Um, but it's got a little age on it. Okay. So it's, a, so it's an how... older, dignified, uh, stately kind of beer. How much How much could a beer like that age? Uh, I've got some English, real English barley wines in the basement that are 30 years old. Wow. Uh, the last one I had was just a couple of years ago. It was in 1986, and man, that was good. Mm-hmm. So did you, but you went out shopping and you found this on the shelf, right? It's not- uh, yeah, some brewer, some liquor stores, some limited liquor stores will have, will keep stuff back, keep stuff mm-hmm. cellar, and then uh, bring it out every once in a while for sale. Okay. Yeah, when I tried to get some up here, I called all over and I kept, being told no, no, no to all three of your beers. And finally, somebody told me it's out of season. So she was surprised that you had been able to buy it. It is out of season, but there's still some sitting around on shelves all the time. Okay. She did um, offer to just, get like me I some. Said, this one, this store pulled out some stuff that they had kept back to age mm-hmm. intentionally. Mm-hmm. So did you have to ask specifically for it? No, it was on the shelf. It was. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, She, she offered to get me some from her supplier, but she couldn't get it till Wednesday. So yeah, yeah, that's a little late. I, but now that you've described it and you should hold it up for the camera, it, it sounds so good. I should have asked her and I should have taken a picture of that smile, especially. (laughs) (laughs) It is so delicious. Super delicious. Hold hold that. You got to totally hold that smile. Go ahead. So that match, that matches the poem then? Is that yep. it? Go go ahead and read the That's first great. poem intake. That's great. I don't know if the guy drank at all, but okay. <laughs> I know that I age well in cellars or anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not find out. I, I'm gonna okay. Intake. Elderly man, silvery hair, 
Modest blue serge suit leans forward anxiously, holding his left arm with care. He has severe arthritis, and the symphony told him, consider retirement. At 61, he only knows the violin. The Musicians Union referred him here. He wants to hear possibilities and options of job retraining. He's willing to work. His hand shakes gentle, full of fingers like lonely iron. His smile's warm and waiting like the soft, curious scrutiny of an unsure bluebird. Yeah, very dignified. Um, I love that image of that older man. I'm curious, um, this wasn't one of the questions I had prepared, but the term, the phrase jumped out at me again, fingers like lonely iron. What were you thinking when you wrote that? His uh, grip was very strong. From years of playing violin. He seems old and frail sitting there, you know, mm -hmm. he's about, I don't know, in his mid, late 60s. Mm -hmm. But his handshake was so strong because it was the, yeah, the years. Right, years of violin. violin. Mm -hmm. And I, I, played, I, I played the violin for when I was 8 to 13 and then gave it up for girls in basketball. But <laughs> I did play it for a while. Was, was it a fair trade? I would say so. <laughs> the problem too is my parents, my parents were upset because of the seventh grade talent show. I played my violin, but I played Buddy Holly's um, That'll Be the Day on my violin. Oh, how funny. I just listened to that the other day. Yeah, I was playing rock and roll violin for my friends and they loved it, but the adults weren't crazy about it. <laughs> they weren't so impressed, huh? No, because he, that's when people started wearing the I love Elvis and I hate Elvis mm -hmm. button. I okay. don't know if you remember those. You might be too young. No, but. no I don't remember that at all. You you were in college when I was born, so. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that, that historic strike that, that you right. participated. I, I was, you know, a few months old. So um, this this poem comes from a chapbook, a collection of poems, right? Yeah, the Department of Industrial Claims. Tell, tell us about that chapbook. Well, when I was in uh, school at San Francisco State, where I did got my BA and MA, I worked at Kaiser Hospital and... Um, they had a special department of industrial claims, mainly because they had so many people, patients who'd worked in the shipyards and 20, 30 years later were coming down from various uh, cancers and mesotheliomas from having worked with asbestos in the uh, putting in the brakes of the Liberty ships and the destroyers and different ships and whatnot. Um, it was later part of a national multi-million dollar suit against the Manville Corporation which was a holding company of the DuPont uh, chemical empire. So but we were getting these guys in and they had, uh, you know, cancer of this and, you know, chronic, you know, COPD, chronic pulmonary. And it just overwhelmed me. And I kept on, my job was to get work histories from people who were dying. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I had to stop in the middle so they could take a tug on the respirators. Mm -hmm. And I just started writing about it and I started doing these like sort of Spoon River type monologue to describe the person through the way they talked or way they their gestures, but very um, polished and, you know, cut down, you know, very minimal. So that's the story. I have about 20 oh. of them. How, how did you end up working there? Was it a campus job or was it just a job? Uh, yeah, I found it on the campus bulletin board, you know. Okay. It's funny, like, you didn't need any experience if you were a white student, but you, if you were a Filipino housekeeper and you applied for that job as a ward clerk and then, you know, a clerk taking histories, you had to be able to type 80 words a minute. So uh, we had to file a grievance about that or about racism and discrimination. Mm -hmm. yeah. was, that part of, was that part of what led to the strike? Oh, no, no, the strike was on the campus. Well, that was something completely different from the job. No, yeah, but the job, they had a strike at Kaiser, 
that we have okay. six months. That's a different story. Yeah. Okay. Um, how? At what point did you decide to collect all these poems together in a chapbook? Did did this form as an idea? Let me write all of these. Or did it start more with you just wrote one and then another and another and finally said, hey, why don't I put these together? A little, a little of both. You know, I, I've mostly written fiction over the years and sort of like had a snobby attitude towards my own poetry. But when uh -huh. I read it and so many people liked it and I used it with my students and the high school where I taught at, we had uh, the 16 years we had a poetry slam every spring and I was the only one of the few teachers that would read their poems. So I read some of those poems there and they loved it. So I decided, oh, maybe there's something to this, you know. I had published some in the 80s and 70s with uh, um, publishers that were open to work poetry and there weren't that many. But now, now that all the publishers have discovered social justice, like it's some new kind of mineral mm -hmm. you know, and there's a demand for it, Whereas during the time I was writing this, there were still people who had been blackballed from the in the in the fifties for writing work poetry, you know. Oh, really? Yeah, Merida Lesur. She's the, uh, the, the the legend saint of Saint Paul from Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. You know, the legendary I feminist know. writer. Huh? No, no. Oh, you'd love her. I, I may know of her, but um, I, I came a little late to poetry. Um, I've been more kind of involved in fiction. Uh, yeah. But this book has a very interesting um, evolution, I, I think is the word. First of all, did you have, did you put all your poems into this book? Or are there like a hundred more that I just... Have, I, have, I, have, I have lots and lots of poems. And, uh, I mean, about I, workers specifically who, who you met at this job. Um, I, I probably could write another chapbook full mm -hmm. yeah. I mm -hmm. mean a lot of the workers that I met there are in my book of short stories okay and uh, it, uh, there are stories about two hospitals a hospital I worked in there which was part of Kaiser Industries and then a hospital I worked in when I went to Antioch College a work study program uh, in South Boston in a slum and uh, I was working on the terminal cancer ward so mm -hmm. Oh, oh interesting. So you and I had talked on the phone a few weeks ago in, in preparation for this, and I didn't realize these were two separate hospitals. So yeah. I wanted to get into this, uh, that it was optioned for this program, the PBS series Aussie and Ruby, or with Aussie. Yeah, yeah. What, tell, tell our viewers about that program. I did some digging into it, but I'm betting most of our listeners, I shouldn't say viewers, most of them aren't viewing, but... Um, I'm betting most of our listeners don't know anything about them. Uh, Ruby died when she was quite old, 91. And yeah, I, yeah. That's like, I think that was in 2014. Yeah. So tell, tell our 50 million listeners about Ruby and Ossie. Oh, God. Ruby and Ossie D were an African-American couple. They're crazy about each other. They were leftists, if not communists, around the Communist Party. And they were also very active in a cultural program of one of the most progressive unions in the United States, um, Local 250 Hospital Workers Union, that had a Bread and Roses program where they did cultural, you know, um, plays and readings and promoted working class artists. And uh, so they were a known quantity both in Hollywood and both in the drama scene in New York City. And when I came back to New York from San Francisco with a manuscript of the stories, um, I met a small drama troupe, a workers do plays about workers, and they knew Ossie and Ruby, and they said, Ernie, you should send these stories to Ossie and Ruby, because a couple of them are perfect for her, and a couple of them are perfect for him, which I did, and they loved it, and then we took it from there. And... So um, how did this PBS series work? Was it them reading oh, that, was, yeah, that was funny. That was funny because um, when my agent named Frances Golden, who was also a housing activist, when she first sent it to them, to PBS, they said, we love this and we want to do it and we're educational, but since we're educational, our funds are limited, blah, 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 blah. 
and he will get his name as a credit in front of millions of people on TV. And, uh, and my agent said, well, tell you what, when we know that the actors are not being paid and doing this for free and the camera people and the lighting people are doing it all for free, then we'll agree that Mr. Brill can also do it for free. And then they came back and said, how about 3,500 for three years? <laughs> so she was a cracker jack and, um, and Ruby loved it and pushed it. Yeah, Ruby did this. It's a story about a, a three-part story about a job evaluation and the refusal of a nurse's aide to sign the job evaluation that this sort of prejudiced supervisor wants her to sign. Okay, so I, I think uh, maybe I got it wrong. Was it your chapbook that was featured on the PBS series, or was it your? No, okay. it, was one, it was a story, and um, she adapted it for public TV. Mm -hmm. And it was part of a, a series called With Ruby and Asi. It's like a half hour variety show. Okay. And sometimes they'd have drama or music or, you know, stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is pretty exciting, and it was it was so exciting. Plus, right. I got thirty five hundred dollars for it, you know. Even though you had to fight for it, but yeah, good for you for standing up. Um, there's a lot of oh, that. Hey, I, you'll get I, recognition. My agent. I had a good agent. Yeah, you know? that makes a difference. So I have one last question about this. Um, you yeah. must have seen probably hundreds of these people coming through what drew you to the particular ones you chose to write about what what drew you to this violinist i i would wake up at two o'clock in the morning thinking about the person and trying to write a poem about him mm -hmm. so it's as if certain people just sort of spoke to you yeah it haunted me it's okay it's um, i you know it's such a clear image of him and you know, I, I think part of the reason that poem speaks to me in particular is because that's me, you know, like this is all I know how to do is play music. And um, uh -huh. I mean, I can do a little more than that. I can write, you know, I can do a podcast. But as far as my education, my entire life's work has been in music. And so when I couldn't teach lessons last year, you know, it, it was... A, a bit of a feeling of that situation of I've spent my whole life in music. I know how to play piano and flute and all these yeah. instruments and teach yeah. them. And if I can't teach, I have to figure out what I can do next. So I really relate to that poem. Uh, um, yeah. What did you play? Um, actually, trombone was my major instrument. Mm -hmm. So in fact, I relate very well because I ended up developing something called embouchure dystonia when I was, I believe I was about 29 and so I'd spent my life from the time I was 12 playing trombone playing in youth symphonies big bands semi-professionally I had my degree in it and all of a sudden with this dystonia I couldn't play anymore wow. and yeah. so you know I was right there with your 60 year old violinist saying uh now what <laughs> so I wrote a book instead um right you know, raise You're nine right. kids instead um I think we're ready for beer number two Michael all right, beer number two. And I just want to say, Laura, the, the easier question might be, what don't you play? <laughs> well, that is absolutely true. I'm, I, I don't play harmonica, and I do okay. not play bag. I try you don't play once banjo. Store. That's you true, I don't. But Chris had to go to a music store yesterday. He bought himself a 12-string guitar. And uh, the one of the string snaps, we had to run into Duluth and get some strings. And we were looking at all the instruments in the store that we don't have, because we've probably got like 75 between us. Um, and we're like, we don't have that two neck guitar. We don't have those. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there are a few things I don't play. So right. two. So beer number two. Uh, this is from Pipeworks Brewing in Chicago. And this is called Baked and Layered. Uh, I'm just going to read the, what this is. Wait, this is hold it up again. Bacon Let me get a picture. Layered. Is this the one that says gobbledygook jargon, too much mumbo jumbo, everything? <laughs> it says that. So, yeah. It's kind of, kind of, kind of. So baked and layered. This is an imperial stout with chocolate malts, lactose, cocoa nib, toasted coconut, and vanilla. And that it is 10.5% alcohol. 
So I chose this because this poem, this next poem represents everything that is wrong with academia and corporate America and any kind of endeavor that's loaded with jargon and gobbledygook. So uh, saying, saying much without saying anything, <laughs> uh, or at least without saying anything worthwhile. And so I decided I wanted to choose a beer that to me represents everything that is wrong with the brewing industry at this point. And it's kind of similar in that this is, this is what you would call a milkshake or a pastry beer. And the idea is you take a beer, like a normal beer style, and load it down, particularly with lactose and unfermentable sugar that leaves some sweetness and, and fullness, and yeah. vanilla. So you get this caked thing. Um, and I will say this one, for a, for a pastry beer, this is not horrible. I'm not going to drink it, accolades. but it isn't horrific. You, you've um, got to hold it up so I can see what it looks like. Are it's you saying that pastry, oh, it's, pastry it's, beers okay. set a category? Pastry, pastry beers. beers? Really? It's, it, it's a mistake. It's a thing. That, it's an aberration that should not exist. My other okay. option for this was going to be a peanut butter uh, stout, which do you, to me do you is a thing that should, should not be. exist. Oh. Uh, this, so this beer represents to me everything that is wrong with the, the current beer industry. Okay. <laughs> that's why and, okay. So, okay. So two questions. How do you like the taste and how do I like the taste? You might like it. It's very sweet. Okay. Uh, so I, I it might not be it. too sweet for you. Um, uh, you probably would like it. I do not like it. Like I said, it's not horrific, but I'm not going to drink it. <laughs> I drink that's this a little bit, but that's it. I probably love it. I probably love I, it. I wish you could just pass it through the screen. I want to try it, mm -hmm. but as uh, I said, I I couldn't get it up here. So I think that we are ready for poem number two, and it's called "End of Faculty Meeting." Right, Ernie? Let me give it my seltzer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the schools competing in a global world. Critical thinking is absolutely key to help stay in context on the same theme and not waste time on questions off topic that could be researched in other venues. By lining up all our ducks in a row, we establish measurable components to show us where we need more improvement and areas where we exhibit strength. Understanding that while change takes time we must raise the level of expectation. I know there's only a few minutes left, but does anyone have any concerns? If not, thank you for all that you do. You're dismissed. <laughs> read that for me one more time. I want to hear what? that. Read, read that one more time. I want to hear that again. The poem? Yeah. Okay. The schools competing in the global world, critical thinking is absolutely key to help stay in context on the same theme and not waste time on questions off topic that could be researched in other venues. By lining up all our ducks in a row, we establish measurable components to show us where we need more improvement and areas where we exhibit strength, understanding that while change takes time, we must raise the level of expectation. I know there's only a few minutes left, but does anyone have any concerns? If not, thank you for all that you do. You're dismissed. Wonderful, yeah. You know, I've, I've really lucked out. I've had to sit through very, very few such meetings, but I lucky hear- Lucky you, lucky you. Oh. Can I just say, I love the last line, thank you for all that you do. <laughs> <laughs> which, which was primarily sitting there probably doodling and trying to look interested. <laughs> if I had a nickel for every time that heard that, I'd be a rich man. So my, my first question is, what spawned this? Was there a specific incident or was it just this a is almost, This is almost verbatim from our faculty, same fact, quote, faculty meeting that was never a faculty meeting because just the principal reporting and bugging us about stuff 
and telling us what had been done that we needed to follow without any interaction or questions, like mm -hmm. many principles. But we That's were excellent. strong staff, so we stood on our principles. Oh, excellent. And of course, here's where we make a bad pun about standing on the principle. <laughs> um, so your career, your BA and MA are both in English, correct? Yeah, I read more. I tried to read more literature from other countries than English literature. I can tell you that right now. Mm -hmm. So what, what, where did you branch out to? I branched out to becoming an early expert or advocate champion in literature, all the stuff people are yakking about now, multicultural literature, mm -hmm. social justice literature, literature from all over the world. But top-notch writers like Darwish, like Neruda, you know, Simborska from Poland, uh, Achebe from Nigeria, mm -hmm. people who are yeah. black, the great writers from the, from the Midwest, Tom McGrath from North Dakota, Meridale from Minnesota. Oh, there's so many writers that were blacklisted. And of course, Richard Wright, one of my heroes, and Virginia Woolf, one mm -hmm. of my total heroes. So. Yeah, it's very varied. I read a lot, a lot. Given that this was in the 60s and 70s, and if they were being blacklisted, you couldn't just go on the internet, you know, find this stuff. How did you find some of these people that were not so well known at the time? Well, I wrote to one guy, and he, he gave me the addresses of the other people, a guy named Jack Conroy, who was a pioneering uh, small press guy from Missouri, and... Um, he invited me to actually a Midwest Writers Conference in 78. That's where I met the writers in San Francisco. I met my peers by going to their readings and reading their books that fellow English students and people at San Francisco State were publishing. San Francisco State had an incredible student body because it was a, a working class college. So the average age was 40. And wow. we had Latino students, African-American students. Chicano students, and then they would tell me about writers from their country, like Carlos Fuentes from Mexico, or Cesar Viejo from Peru, and I would just read away, or the Iranian Students Association would tell me about writers from the uh, Middle East. Plus, I went to bookstores, and I found books there, and then if the writer was alive, sometimes I would contact them, so Mm -hmm. I did contact quite a few writers. Um, what was your response to some of these contacting them? Did did they typically answer back? Well, yes and no. I mean, I had more luck with minority writers than I did with white writers or Jewish writers. So I'll tell you that. I'm Jewish. But, I mean, Saul Urich, Grace Paley, um, they responded to me. But the black writers like... Um, uh, Tony Cade Bambara, we were friends, uh, John A. Williams, you know, they responded and they loved my book. So, yeah, it mm -hmm. was good. Very good which, experience. Which book, which book of yours did they love, the chapbook or the short stories? Well, I ne no, I never published the chapbook, but the short okay. stories. John A. Williams just wrote me back and he says, you write your ass off, you know, so that was great. That's Come fantastic. But well, it reminds they, me of... A story in my own life. Um, my my books are time travel to medieval Scotland, and they were partially inspired by a book called In the Keep of Time by Margaret Anderson. And so through a series of events, I realized that even though I read her book in the 70s, she was alive and well. And so I mm. sent an email one day. We had talked previously about her republishing her books now that she can do it in Kindle and all of this. And so about a year later, I sent her an email and I said, if I just happen to be in Oregon, you know, could I meet you for lunch? Could I take you out to lunch? And she invited right. me to her home and a friend and I spent most of the day there and she made us dinner and she showed us around her five acres and she's like 85, told us all about her life and one of her daughters was there. And that's, I can tell you from personal experience and obviously, you know, it's, it's a thrill to write to meet a writer that you admire. So that's yeah. a real story. Yeah, I had, a friend, I had a friend who arranged for me to meet with Alice Walker. And she did. liked the Crazy Hattie story. <clears throat> and um, another writer, I don't know if you know her, Alice Childress. Uh, the name she is familiar. Wrote, she wrote this incredible uh, 
They marketed it as a YAL, but it should have been marketed as a novel. It was called A Hero Ain't Nothing But a Sandwich about a kid who's getting addicted to drugs. Mm -hmm. There's multiple points of view from his mother, um, her boyfriend, uh, he's going at uh, his teachers, the drug dealer. And um, it was banned because of the drug dealer. And I went to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. and won. But anyway, she called me up at 1030 at night to tell me how much she liked the crazy Hattie story. So that was just amazing. Very cool. Amazing. Yeah. So, yeah. So what I do, uh, I also wrote to writers, you know, I wrote mm -hmm. to letters. I wrote to one of the Hollywood 10 guys and he sent him my book and he sent me back a 10 page letter telling me all these things that was wrong with my book. <laughs> was he right about them or was he just... Huh? Full no, you could argue about it. You know, he wants me to give one of the one of my uh, characters, and I looked over Jordan a wife. You know, mm -hmm. and I said, "This guy's a loner. He doesn't have a wife. That's the point of the goddamn story." You know. <laughs> <laughs> so he kind of just wanted you to write a different story. Well, I guess yeah, well, I guess you can say though, at least he read it. Oh yeah. no! He read, he, read, he read the whole. No, he said. He said this is the, this is the longest letter I will have written anybody in fifteen years. I said, so he cares enough to do that. That's great, you know. And and that's exactly what I was going to say. He read the book and he took the time to talk about it. Yeah, and he was one of the Hollywood ten. But he he had written a bunch of novels along with his screenplays, and I thought his novels were better than his screenplays. You know. Mm -hmm. So um, you've spent your life as, what, a professor of English? No, I was a high school teacher for okay. 23 years. But okay. I, was an adjunct, I was an adjunct teacher at a low residency college in Vermont. That was great, okay. you know. Once a month, okay. seven people, people going back to school, bringing all their life experience. That was mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah, that was just mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah. I, you know, if you told me when I left high school, I'd be a high school teacher. I would have said, you're out of your mind. <laughs> I, I know that feeling because there was a time in my life when I said, I will never teach music. I will specifically never direct a band because I saw how frustrated my sixth grade band director got because you got 70 kids with noisemakers and you're trying to get music out of them and trying to get them settled down. And we used to, in junior high with our band director, we used to be so crazy that we would he would just leave, go into his office and smoke a cigarette and come back out. <laughs> That's great. I, I remember my sixth grade band director throwing a baton across the room. <laughs> yeah. We would, in, when I said, I'm we, never we, doing we, this. We would bebop all the Christmas carols, you know. We would have uh -huh. people camp during, um, oh, God, Silent Night. Uh -huh. We'd have babies crying and wailing. and Oh, God, it was fun. Anyway, come all ye faithful. But I, uh, no, we, we would read about three books a year in my high school. That was ridiculous. So um, my high school that I taught at here in Northampton, Massachusetts, they'd been cited by the state 93 for not having enough books by women and writers of color. So they hired me because I had a success in Chinatown where I taught three years. And... Um, they hired me to change the curriculum, except some of the teachers wouldn't go along with it. That's a big job. I think we're actually ready for beer number three. But that was okay, beer number, number three. three. Finally, we get to my kind of beer. Although I will say I love Commander, my fr the first one, but it is definitely a slow sipper. Uh, better for a cold night than mm. record heat. <laughs> uh, so this next beer is from... Arbeiter Brewing, which is a brewery, a new brewery in Minneapolis, which is actually just up the street from my house. Um, mm. This is Arbeiter Beer. It is their flagship, if you will. Let me see if okay. I can get that in focus. You got that, Laura? I so, do, and I think, I think I'm going to get a reflection of my dog's big nose in the screen, too. Did you see that? All right. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. So this is... A straightforward lager, my kind of beer. Um, so I chose this one because first the, the poem, the, the subject in the poem is a worker. 
a laborer, uh, a port worker, um, longshoreman, I suppose. But he doesn't um, drink port. He doesn't drink port, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I wanted to, so what's a beer that this person likely drank? Ah. And that would be a straightforward lager. Uh, mm -hmm. It helps that Arbeiter in Germany, in German, is worker. <laughs> so ah. uh, it is not only a beer that this person probably would have drank, it is also Arbeiter beer from Arbeiter Brewing. So it's, it's all about laborers. Uh, so I just thought it appropriate uh, yeah. for this next poem. Definitely. You would not like this, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can almost guarantee it. Yeah, like, you know, I, I grab my own oh. beer and see. It looks the same. Like yours. I could have passed it off. I could have lied and said I've got it. Um, I'm drinking for the sore throat today. I don't really care how it tastes. So just a quick history of this brewery. I wrote a, a Star Trib column about them. Oh, Star, cool. Minneapolis Star Tribune. Because uh, they just recently opened. And their journey to opening was like hell. So first, as they were trying to get going, they were hit with uh, Trump's steel tariffs, which yeah. increased the cost of their brewing equipment and delayed their shipment. Um, then they ran into problems with uh, the city of Minneapolis uh, in terms of stuff. Um, then as they were just about to get, oh, then of course the pandemic, <laughs> um, and Murphy was they, alive and well. Yeah, uh, which slowed everything down, so they couldn't get workers to come in and work on the work on the brewery. And then a year ago, as they were sort of getting things going, their brewery happens to be about 150 yards from the third precinct building in Minneapolis. Oh uh, no! Which was the epicenter of the riots after the George George Floyd murder. Mm -hmm. um, and so they they were in the middle of that uh, as they were trying to get open. So it was it was quite the quite the journey for them to try and get, get their brewery terrible. open. Wow! Oh my god! It's, it's amazing that they got off the ground at all. Yeah. Whoever's opening it must be extremely persistent. Yes. Um, lots of resources. It's it's good they finally did. So, uh, are we ready for poem number three, Longshore? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Longshoreman. Art's work for 37 years involved working the docks of the Bay Area. My ships come in from all over the world. You name the country, I unloaded it. Often, some holds had dust so white and thick, Art couldn't see co-workers feet away. We never got the gear guys got to get today. The masks, the respirators, the rest breaks. Didn't happen until the late 40s. And the big strike and the union came. Where'd I work? What did I work? Let's see now. Pier 13, cotton pants from Korea. Pier 8, Brazilian cow hides. Boy, they stank. Pier 20 was Australian wool. Pier 39, Copper from the Congo. Can't forget my favorite one, Tier 7. Jameson's Whiskey Crates from Ireland. I'll tell you what you can do for me, son. He wheezes, sucking his respirator. For, as far as the money goes, I'll get by. Better if you figure a way to get me some new lungs. That's a uh poignant poem i was was he speaking with a bit of humor in that last line mm. if you think that older working class people can have a sense of irony then i would say irony. Uh, my grandfather would have said that totally joking and he would have been laughing if he said it you know yeah. and that's why i'm curious you know people face these things in different ways Definitely. Yeah. So um, this one is from your hospital chapbook, correct? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It was one of the early ones. Yeah. And I, I read through, I think you sent me the entire thing, not just part of it. Really? really? You, there were quite yeah. a few. 
Yeah, yeah, you sent me, and I, I'm assuming that it was the entire collection, not just part of it, but I read through all of them, and I just, I found it a wonderful collection because it describes so many different people from so many walks of life, you know, right. uh, yeah. they're, all, they're all facing death, and they're all talking about how they've lived their lives. We've got everything from a symphony musician to these people who are hard physical labor all their lives they're all right. coming to the same end and i got the impression did you spend a lot of time just sitting and listening to them above and beyond the intake forms yeah well i you know i talk with them and sometimes i go see them on my break i'm a i'm a talkative you know i come from a storytelling very talkative fan we're, we're not reticent let's put it that way you know <laughs> My my principal said, "You're not a teacher. You're a storyteller." And my students <laughs> love the stories. And if they had me twice, some of them would say, "You told the story a different way the last time, Mister Brill." <laughs> and was was it you just a different something. facet of the story? What? What? Was it just a different facet of the story? It wasn't like you just totally rewrite history every time. No, you might improvise a little bit and throw a detail in that you had not okay. before. Okay, so just, and, and I can see that, you know, that you remember a different detail each time you tell it. So, you know. I have a really good, I have a very good auditory memory, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm known as the human jukebox. I can do all the songs. That's great. From the 60s and stuff like that. So. I, I think you would love one of our, in fact, it was the very first guest we had on our podcast, Lauren Nemi. He's a storyteller. He's pretty much made a career of being a storyteller, um, oh. telling stories on the Great Wall of China. That's what he does. And I think what? you two would get along great. Um, you know, one of your poems actually talks about the value of the artist to society and talks about how society often really doesn't want artists to do what they do. They want them to do something different. Which one, uh, which one is that? Um, what poem is that? I don't, I don't know the title off the top of my head, but I just read it last night. It was kind of set up like a villanelle. So it was three lines and it was a lot of words rhyming with measure, treasure. Oh yeah, no, that's a villanelle. Right, it's a villanelle. Yeah, I like to write villanelles, yeah. But I mean, you get, you get the risk of being too preachy and sounding too formal, but yeah, no, that was around the same time I wrote the other one about teaching. Yeah. Yeah. About the end of faculty meeting. Yeah. That was when, you know, the, the, the difference between like having the students do creative projects, which is where I had my great successes and, and doing this MCAS, you know, required testing bullshit, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just underestimating students all the time the talent that they have oh i went to talk about students and talent i went to there's a school here in minneapolis called the chesterton academy and it's sort of based on some older principles of teaching and one of the things they teach is art so i went to this big gala fundraiser that they held and I was looking at all these things that were being auctioned off to help raise money for the school. And I thought they had brought in professional artists to do this whole group right. of things. Yeah. I, I realized it was the students' artwork. It looked professional. And these were, you know, 14, yeah. 15, 16 year old kids. Yeah. And I talked to their teacher about it. And he said, you know, it's the difference between teaching a little bit about a whole bunch of different forms and really digging in and teaching foundations and building up year by year. So yeah, students can do an amazing amount. You know, some of the youth symphonies I used to play with, you know, these kids are playing close to professional level. Yeah, never underestimate students. But my, my question was, I was thinking about that poem that's talking about how society doesn't necessarily like what artists do sometimes. I'm thinking about this collection of poems that you have written about all these people who are facing death. What value does a collection like this bring to the world in your mind? It brings more respect for working people, which doesn't exist. You know, they talk about the, 
the essential workers. This is what infuriates me. But it's such it's such hogwash because when the uh, pandemic ends, those people are going to go back to do the same jobs, probably at the same rate of pay. This fifteen dollars thing is going to get like, you know, put off and put off and put off. I mean, I've seen it so my whole entire life. So, um, so you know, just there's another part of the world that people don't see. It's just like, you know, with race, you're, you're not going to see, you can go through your whole life and not see it. Some people not see an African-American person unless it's on TV or in a CD, you know? So that's what I'm about is um, showing the world as it really is on all sides. Or the other side of what's not seen, you know? Well, and that brings me to the question, I, I think a book like this or a collection of poems could have been written multiple ways. You know, you're in a hospital, in fact, as we discussed earlier, two different hospitals where you're seeing a lot of people at the end of their lives. I think there were many angles or facets you could have taken, and you took the angle of focusing on how the work that they did all their lives ultimately harmed them. Why did you pick that particular facet of seeing people die or in their dying weeks and months? Okay, because it's it's one of the least things talked about anywhere. It's certainly one of the least things written about in, mm -hmm. in literature. You have to go far and wide to find a novel about a major industrial accident <laughs> like the poisoning in Gopal in India. You know, I mean, very, very few. There was the jungle, mm -hmm. right? There was the jungle. There's a book by B. Traven called The Death Ship about um, large insurance put on ships that tend to sink, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's just people don't talk about it. And people die from on the job accidents every day, you know. Right, right. Especially men. Um, I think that's much more. Men, but, but a lot of women are poisoned on their jobs, their horrible jobs, like plucking chickens in Laurel, Mississippi, um, sweatshops. <laughs> There's a longer standing one with um, breathing problems from working with, uh, you know, clothing material and right. stuff like that. Uh, I didn't even get to those, but uh, yeah. So you've got a lot of work left to do. I did want to, before we run out of time, I wanted you to tell a little bit about, I think you said it's an 18-page story told in three parts. Yeah, that's the crazy thing. What is that story. about? Oh, well, it's a form I came upon myself. Um, first of all, I should say that one of the few stories I came about a worker being harassed on their job was solo song by James Allen McPherson from his book, Hue and Cry, African-American writer. Mm -hmm. He wrote this in 64. He taught at Iowa for 30 years. And Hue and Cry in his second book, which won the Pulitzer in 78, um, Elbow Room, are two of the finest short story collections anywhere. So he it was sort of a model for mine, but mm -hmm. the few parts. So what I did was I had, um, I had somebody observing the argument between the two people, right? Third person, straight third person, traditional, right? But then the second part was a memo from the head nurse about this employee whose performance was below acceptance. Mm -hmm. It was a very formal memo written in memo language, sort of like the end of the faculty meeting poem. And then mm -hmm. the third part was a raging monologue by the nurse's aide about what a creep this person was and how she distorted reality. So there were a bunch of examples that the head nurse gave why her work wasn't up to snuff, but then you saw it from another point of view. Mm -hmm. And, and I it just perfectly, and I wrote the story, I hadn't planned on it. It wasn't in my outline when I returned to New York with half the stories done, but then one night I heard this woman's voice. I'd worked with her for six years on the swing shift. Her name was Hannah. You know, they said, oh, Kratz, just crazy Hannah. She was 65, still working. Mm -hmm. And um, I heard a voice and it just took me over for like two weeks working 16 hours a day. And then I, I also wrote a story about a 
I worked in a methadone program for seven years in the Bronx. And I wrote one about a pill head who was crazy. He was a really good uh, artist. Mm -hmm. with this one, it was called The Many Transfers of Jamie Santos. This guy keeps getting transferred because he's explosive. And it's, that starts with the monologue. Then it has the formal meeting where he's transferred to his sixth clinic, his sixth transfer. And then there's a description of his drawings, which are like devastating. Mm -hmm. We are about out of time, and so I wanted to introduce the guest we have next week. Like I said, <laughs> I didn't bring a printer to the Great North Woods with me, so this is in my handwriting, scrawled out last night. Hopefully I can hey, read I have to ask the question, Laura. Mm -hmm. What do we have next time? Oh, I'm glad you <laughs> <went>. <laughs> We have to do this the right way. Uh, now. Next month, we have a novelist, Jeff LaFerney, and he writes more young adult novels, I believe, although I have a few of his on Kindle, and I still need to get to finishing reading them. I started some of them, but, you know, my life has been crazy for the last, oh, seven months or so. Um, Jeff LaFerney was a full-time language arts teacher in Davison, Michigan, for 30 years. Whoa. After coaching basketball for most of his career, he decided to write books instead and took on his new hobby. Now he spends his free time reading, writing, and editing books. His Clay and Tanner Thomas series focuses on a father-son team who use parapsychological abilities to solve mysteries. I'm looking forward to reading that one. Uh, one of them, it's a series. Jumper is a time travel sci-fi adventure, which of course will appeal to me too. Lost and Found is a unique treasure hunt with ties to World War II history. Another thing that's going to appeal to me, his latest, Planer, is the sequel to Jumper. He keeps a blog called The Red Pen, where he often infuses humor to share about himself and give writing tips. So I've looked at his blog, The Red Pen, um, in the past, and he has excellent writing advice uh, for any of our 50.3 million listeners who happen to be writers. All right, so, and the next question is? Where can we find us? <laughs> where can we find us? You I am at, uh, a perfect, I am at aperfectpine.net and aperfectpine on the socials. We are at booksandbrews.net and book and brews on Instagram and books and brews with Laura Vosica and Michael Agnew on Facebook. Laura? And I am at lauravosica.com, and I think that bluebellschronicles.com will also get you to my brand new site. Well, it's maybe about eight or nine months old now, but pretty new. Um, long story. And I'm on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash laura.vosica.author, and Victor, O-S-I-K-A. And Ernie, do you have any links where people can find your work? Um. If you Google my name, not Wikipedia, you can get a whole lot of places where I've published stuff. Okay. There are stories. Um, there's, uh, I did a three hour uh, reading about the San Francisco state strike. It's pretty interesting with seven people. So just Google my name and you'll get a bunch of things. Yep, and I'll just spell that to make sure people know. It's the E-R-N-I-E-B-R-I-L-L, -L, correct? That's right, yeah. And do you have any upcoming events, Michael? Nope. <laughs> Ernie, do you have any upcoming events? I have a permits for one of my cats. But <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking public events, but maybe that is. Oh. I I would no, no, it is. It is. All the cats in the community are coming. That sounds like right. fun. Um, uh, I, I really have nothing going on except um, Gabriel's Horn is accepting submissions of love poems for our third annual poetry anthology. It's a collection of new poetry in traditional forms. And in fact, Ernie's poetry is in the second edition, uh, Startled by Nature. So this one is startled by love, any sort of love, you know, romantic, familial, parental, uh, you know, siblings, whatever. Um, what about love of ice cream? I think that that could work.
if you really, really love ice cream, I mean, I really, really love my dog. I really love trombones. I, <laughs> I might write some poems about those things. <laughs> All right. Uh, this trombones, has been... You don't need a tune-up for the trombones. <laughs> you know what they say about perfect pitch when you throw the oboe and it lands on the trombone. <laughs> uh, my, my, my banjo teacher was talking about how hard it is to keep a banjo in tune and said, there's a good reason that there are so many bad banjo stories. <laughs> <laughs> that's well, great. May, maybe it's that people are too picky. <laughs> ah, that's a good one. That's a good one. All right. This has been episode 27 of the Books and Brews podcast. Uh, thanks, Ernie, for stopping in with us and chatting. Thank you uh, for inviting thank, me. Great. I want to thank everybody out there for tuning in. Uh, cheers. Cheers. Anytime, cheers. <laughs>